Hey there, Dr. Alan Christensen here with you. So I heard a, a story recently about an economist, and in the political world, it is a disaster to flip-flop or change your mind. And he was being called out on changing his mind on an economic policy. The man's response was really brilliant. He said, hey, when I'm faced with new evidence, I change my mind. What do you do? <laughs> so I've changed my mind about something, and I want to share this with you all. Soy and thyroid disease. So when I first wrote The Complete Idiot's Guide to Thyroid Disease, I argued that I didn't see much evidence saying that soy was a bad thing for those who had thyroid disease. I, I couldn't find any. Over the ensuing years, I think the fervor against soy intensified in just the general world with the paleo movements, and especially in the thyroid world. And I don't know, I think I thought that where there's smoke, there's got to be some fire. And also I thought, well, say you were avoiding it and you didn't need to, what harm could there be in that? You know, what harm is there in avoiding it unnecessarily? So I would go along with the discussions about saying, sure, just avoid that. And I thought there was, you know, possible risk and possible risk by having it and no real harm to avoiding it. And honestly, I, in retrospect, would fault myself for not looking at the primary research more closely about that. But I sense, I sense have, and I just want to share with you all the information that's been found to date. So it'd be a lot easier to ignore it, but, but here's the data. So if we, ignore, if we ignore the test tube studies, and we ignore the ideas, and we ignore the animal studies, we focus on human research. And there is human research. There have been many good human studies. So if we fo let's focus just on those. Now, there are two human studies that I found that have suggested problems relative to soy and thyroid disease. So one, one of which is about infants and children. Uh, there was problems with soy formula being triggers for thyroid disease, especially before the 1960s. Now, what happened was that formulas were given to babies who had no other food intake. They had no other nutrients coming in. So they had to really cover the bases accurately, but not excessively for a lot of nutrients. And when soy formulas were first made, the Meat researchers did not understand that mineral absorption was not the same in soy as it would be in the matrix of cow's milk. And so many children would get similar amounts of iodine, iron, or zinc, but they may not absorb them the same way from soy from dairy. So they had to simply change the formulations. And once the formulations were changed, then those problems disappeared. There really were no ongoing issues past the reformulation that factored in absorption of nutrients. So that was one thing. But human studies that still persist, there's, there's two. One was done on the rate of autoimmunity amongst children. And this one looked at siblings, uh, some of which had been on soy formula, some of which had not. It was a small group. This was from the 90s. So it was after that change that I talked about. And they did show there was a 13% higher risk of developing autoimmunity in those that had soy formulas against those that did not. That data exists. And it was a decently done study. It was a small study, but it's possible. There may be a small factor for soy formulas still encouraging the rate of autoimmune disease. The other study that I'd like to talk about, which is a negative study, is one that was pretty fascinating. They looked at the onset of hypothyroidism amongst those who had subclinical hypothyroidism. So think about it this way. These are people who are on the edge and they're like just about to drop off into overt hypothyroidism. They've got elevated TSH, normal levels of T4, no obvious symptoms. And in these groups, typically about in a given year, six to 7% become overtly hypothyroid. So many do convert and they watched them over a window of about six months total. And in this group, you know, I first read the abstract of the study, and they, the abstract basically said that the, the, soy, the soy interventional group had a higher rate of going from subclinical hypothyroid to overt hypothyroid, which means their T4 dropped off, than the, with the soy group. And I thought, wow, this could be a real problem against soy. So I read the full study in good detail, and it was really bizarre because in this study, <clears throat> there was two groups, but each group was on soy. <laughs> it 
Each group had 30 grams of soy protein, and each group was taking soy supplements. One group took 2 milligrams, and one group took 16 milligrams. And of the 16 milligram group, there was more people who became hypothyroid. There were six that did. Now the other group had no one that became hypothyroid. And oddly enough, for the size of the study and the duration of the study, there should have been more than six people, statistically, that became hypothyroid. So you couldn't really say from the study that the soy was dangerous. You could say that there's a valid question for high-dose soy supplements. But, but honestly, low-dose soy supplements and a rather high amount of soy food cause there to be a lower rate of conversion to hypothyroidism in the group than would have likely occurred otherwise. So that one, it didn't really make sense. And others have written sense about that study and drawn similar conclusions. So really the one, the one piece of data out of hundreds and hundreds of topics on this subject is the one that I mentioned about uh, rates of pediatric autoimmunity on versus soy formula versus non-soy formula. And that one I can't explain. I don't know why that showed up. So that's, that's the negative arguments. And I want to be so candid and transparent because all, all too often I'll see experts that have a strong paleo bias or a strong vegan bias, and they'll honestly they'll they'll finesse things to maintain their bias. Um, my only bias is you and your health. I just want to figure out the best data that'll help you have the best health for the best number of years. That's my only bias. I don't I don't care. I'm not selling soy. I don't care about soy. I'm just looking at the facts and the data. And in some cases, the cases, the situation is very straightforward. Other cases, there are ambiguities. This is that one ambiguity, is that one adolescent study. So let's talk then about what we do know and specific data on the effects of soy overall on thyroid function. Well, there's been some large meta-analysis. And these are great. These are basically studies in which researchers pull together all the data known to date they look it over, they analyze it, and they draw the conclusions from that. What's been shown from the last large meta-analysis, which was 2016, was that all the negative data about soy and thyroid is only based upon the test tube, also called in vitro studies, or the animal studies. And most of the animal studies were really rodents giving high doses of isoflavones as opposed to actual soy food intake. They did also acknowledge that goiter had showed up from soy formula, we talked about that, but that really stopped after soy formulations were updated to fit the nutritional needs. There was also a review in 2006 that pulled together 14 clinical trials, and all these clinical trials showed that neither soy foods nor soy isoflavones have any effect upon thyroid function in men or women. And that was 2006. Since then, another half a dozen, actually just about a dozen large studies have come out. One of the larger studies was over 20,000 women tracked for more than three years. And they tracked them really well. They looked at TSH, free T3, free T4, thyroid antibodies. So imagine that you had uh, 20,000 of your good, good friends that you could say, hey, you guys go over there, check this soy thing out for me. Just eat it and let me watch your thyroid tests every couple months for three years. Just do me a favor, would you mind? <laughs> and you can take another 20,000 friends and say, hey, you guys stay off soy and let's see how your numbers play out. I want to compare the differences. I want to find this out. Wouldn't that be cool if you could do that? Well, people did that. <laughs> That's exactly what they did. And what they saw was that there was no effects whatsoever. There was no changes to any thyroid parameters, even amongst the higher, people that had the highest intake of soy foods. Now, what has been shown is that soy foods can increase the amount of thyroid medication, not because soy blocks your thyroid, but only because soy affects thyroid absorption. And this is the case, not just whenever you have any soy, this is the case if you're taking soy in proximity to taking your thyroid pills. Well, and guess what? That's not unique to soy. We say take your thyroid away from everything else. You know, don't take it with minerals, with breakfast, with good things, because so many things can make you not absorb it properly. So the other question has been if it can worsen existing thyroid function. And the only one study that suggested that it could was the one I mentioned about subclinical hypothyroidism. And the conclusion of that study was not accurate with the actual outcomes of the groups. 
the group itself had a lower rate of conversion to hypothyroidism than they would have been expected to otherwise. That study itself did also show that the group was healthier, that the ones on the soy, the higher version of soy, they had lower rates of high blood pressure, they had better blood sugar metabolism, less insulin resistance, they had lower C-reactive protein. They were healthier people, even though that small subgroup had more conversion than the big group did, which was still on soy. <laughs> so why not just, you know, if there's even some question, why not just avoid it? And that's, that's an important part of this discussion. If soy was completely neutral, then I'd say, you know, even the smallest question, let's just skip it. But that's the problem, and that's why I'm here talking to you. Soy is not completely neutral. There's strong data that soy in the diet cuts the risk of autoimmune disease. Yes, it actually lowers the risk of autoimmune disease. I've got this in the references. Soy in the diet cuts the risk of developing breast cancer. Now it's also been shown by a recent study that soy in the diet cuts the risk of mortality from those who have had breast cancer. Soy also cuts the risk of prostate cancer, of fatal hip fracture, and of cardiovascular disease. So if it were a matter of just avoiding it and no real drawbacks, I'd say avoid it. But there are some drawbacks to avoiding it. There are some good opportunities lost. And what about more current approaches and current ideas? There's actually one large study showing that vegans have lower rates of autoimmune thyroid disease. That one showed up as well. And this study argued that their soy intake may be part of that. I personally don't encourage vegan diets across the board for those that have not chosen them for environmental or ethical reasons. But the argument that soy causes thyroid disease is not founded on any clinical research I can find. Before doing this video and writing this article, I reached out to several of my friends in the thyroid expert space. And I asked them, I said, hey, am I missing something? Are there some studies you can find that I didn't? And there were some that were sent to me, but they were either ones that I've already mentioned here, or they were the test tube studies or the animal studies. And if we had no human studies, that would be worth thinking about. But we have a large human study showing that it didn't have, it didn't hurt. It didn't do bad things to the thyroid. And then many large human studies saying it did do good things elsewhere. In fact, I almost neglected to mention this, there have been studies showing that soy, along with cutting risk of breast cancer, cuts the risk of thyroid cancer amongst women who are premenopausal or menopausal. That's a special risk for women who have thyroid disease. So there's direct benefit from it. So action steps, what does this mean? Certainly, I would not recommend avoiding soy. Have edamame when you're out and about or have it on a regular enough basis at home. Miso is a great quick low calorie pick me up. You know, have miso soup. There's good naturally fermented versions. You know, easy thing is take some good miso paste, do a little bit of dashi, which is a dried fish extract, drop in some scallions or some chives, and you've got a really nice quick broth. A lot of the benefits people have thought about in terms of gut health or whatnot from, from bone broth, you can also think about from miso without, without that lead risk. So that's a great pick me up. Other versions of soy, natto is one. You know, it's always put on the list, but it's not really a commonly available food, and it's a pretty powerful food, so <laughs> there is that. But definitely, the other one to think about is tempeh. So tempeh is fermented soy, and it comes in these nice little blocks, and it's flavorless, but that's fine. A lot of things are flavorless by themselves. You know, you chop it up, you throw it in a stir fry, add in a little sesame oil, add in some, some good tamari, and you've got a wonderful thing to add in as another protein source. So definitely do include those. In terms of other versions of soy, uh, tofu, soy milks, soy protein powders, the data is strong in support of those as well. I'd focus mostly on the fermented, but the data is saying that they can also be helpful. So that's it. Dr. Christensen here. Take great care of yourself, and I'd love to have your input on your effects of soy. I should say there are those that have soy allergies, definitely. So like peanut or shellfish allergies, soy can be an allergen. That's no joke, and that's not something you want to really mess around with. Uh, food sensitivities, I don't see it show up commonly, but it can. That may be lasting, it may not be, but definitely take those into consideration. Otherwise, no real strong reasons that I can find to avoid. Bye-bye. <laughs>